Lieutenant Colonel Matthew Kudelek from Wichita, Kansas, married, father of four girls, served in the Marine Corps for the last 19 years, and I was awarded the Purple Heart as a result of uh, combat action and getting wounded in Lackey, Afghanistan on 5 March 2010. I got commissioned in May of 2001, and of course September 11th occurred about five months later. We deployed initially to northern Iraq in 2003 to Mosul, and uh, saw my first combat on 15 April 2003. It was at the age of 23. The first thing I realized when we went to Fallujah was the fact that you know, in the movies there's always a sound tra track playing in the background. In real combat it's not the case. I immediately remember, distinctly remember walking down the street under heavy fire thinking there's no music playing in the background. This is the real deal. Um, it's extremely loud. I was taken back. I mean when you have RPGs being fired at you, impacting around you, 50 cals, Mark 19s, heavy machine guns, small arms fire, it is extremely loud and extremely decisive. You know when. You know, I've had the opportunity or the experience, several Marines get shot, enemy uh, combatants get shot, uh, human bodies and all sorts of uh, different levels of, uh, of uh, trauma. And when you see that kind of stuff, you realize that this is real human beings and real blood. And you know, what we're doing matters. So after Iraq, uh, you know, I felt a calling in my life to teach and mentor the future generations of officers. So I actually went back to the Citadel and was the Marine officer instructor for three years, training and teaching and mentoring a whole generation of Marines that would deploy to Iraq and Afghanistan. In the summer of 2009, I was a company commander, weapons company, 2nd Battalion, 2nd Marines, and deployed to Afghanistan this time at the peak of the, uh, of the uptick in combat there, a new surge in forces, time with 250 Marines and sailors under my charge. And uh, we operate in the farthest southern battle space in Afghanistan. Well, my company on uh, 4 January 2010, uh, in joint operation with about 150 Afghan soldiers, uh, conducted a nighttime infiltration in a place called Lackey, Afghanistan. We took up this area in Lackey, we secured it on the cover of darkness, and we lived there for the next six months. Uh, totally took the uh, area by surprise, so we re received relatively little resistance initially, and then after a few weeks, uh, we started encountering significant enemy resistance and got into very heavy firefights, long-range firefights for the most part. Uh, in fact, they were, firefights were more intense than some of the ones I encountered during Fallujah just because they had an unlimited amount of quantity of uh, IEDs and um, bullets, machine guns, small arms that they could shoot against us. We were pretty successful. You know, the keys, one of the keys to combat is having a purpose in life every day for yourself and for the people that you lead. And so we stressed it every day, what's our purpose? To take care of each other, protect the local populace, uh, help out any friendly forces, and then also kill or capture as many of the bad guys as possible, which is, of course, critical to achieve their three previous ones. Unfortunately, on uh, 21 February 2010 was the first time I had some Marines underneath my charge who were killed in combat. One of the casualties uh, was Lance Corporal Adam Peake, a very gregarious, outgoing, uh, hard-working, positive Marine. And uh, just so happened the fact that his younger brother served in my unit as well, Lance Corporal Sean Peak. And through a series of timing and circumstances, he was actually near where I was at at the time when I found out that his brother was killed. You know, so it's very challenging to tell somebody, a loved one, that their brother was just killed. You know, like George Washington, I try to maintain a journal throughout my entire adult life. And uh, so I actually still have in my journal right here some of the words I conveyed to his parents. So that night I wanted to write to his parents. I just want to read a little, little excerpt of it that I wrote to his parents, uh, Bruce, and, uh, Bruce and Diana Peak in, uh, in uh, Fort Mitchell, Kentucky. Just a small excerpt. I am very remorseful and truly sorry for the loss of your son. I am so proud and, and honored that I had the honor and privilege to lead such a fine young man as Adam. I can assure you that I will never forget his sacrifice and service in defense of our great nation. May the Lord give you power and strength during this difficult time. I look forward to meeting you and giving you a hug upon my return in May. God bless. By the morning of 5 March 2010, about 150 of us left our patrol base around 3 in the morning and conducted about a 6 kilometer uh, infiltration behind what the enemy thought was their friendly area. And as the sun came up, we had them essentially surrounded on multiple sides and started clearing the entire area and zone. Uh, we had about 9.30, we started getting into significant firefights 
and my headquarters element, which was, you know, we were highly trained, worked together every day, uh, occupied a small cluster of houses in the middle of a field, and uh, we started taking effective fire. You know, not, not really a big deal had it impacted before, but something was unique about this time because for the first time in our deployment, we started encountering very accurate sniper fire, the first sniper fire at all. And I'd heard it before in Fallujah. We, we had a lot of sniper, counter sniper fire in Fallujah five years pr previously. And I knew immediately what it was, and I knew immediately they were going to have significant effects on us if we did not find out where this guy was and take some cover. Because I could tell based off of his rhythm of his shots that he was, he was a trained, well-trained sniper. They were shooting from right in front of me, about 10 meters in front of me, and we were in a heavy firefight, and I was yelling at him to get down. Yeah, he was in the kneeling. And I could hear the first shot, the second shot, and the third shot. Uh, and he, would, he wouldn't listen, respond to me, and I was behind a uh, wall, and the only thing exposed was my head and my lower right leg. And as I was screaming at him again, I just uh, got nailed by a high-velocity bullet from uh, that, with that sniper fired. High-velocity bullet traveled about uh, 1,200 uh, feet a second. Uh, slammed into the inside of my right leg and it uh, destroyed every major component of my right leg. It caused an open compound fracture to my tibia. It severed two or three arteries in my lower leg and it essentially took my entire leg and spun it around about 180 degrees backward. I immediately fell on the ground uh, and I'd seen you know a lot of guys get shot and the first thing I thought of was why in the world does this hurt so bad? It was the most excruciating intense pain that I can that's ever imaginable. I was very fortunate though because I uh, basically landed in the arms of my right hand man, First Sergeant Charles Williams, uh, my corpsman Doc Ty, HM2 Ty, and my radio operator Garrett Baker from uh, Stillwater, Oklahoma. And we'd rehearsed this before, if there's a casualty, this is what we do, and it was like, uh, it, was, it was poetry in motion. My corpsman Im immediately gave me a tourniquet high on my leg, shoved some morphine in me, started, he twisted my leg back around. Uh, that didn't feel too good. He wrapped my wounds and said, you know, we got a problem here because there was blood everywhere, all over me, all over the ground. I could tell my radio operator, who's a good friend, um, he's, you know, we're all very close. Even though we're officer and list, we're all very good friends, very close. We put our lives in the hands of others. And I could tell by his voice and his calls on the radio that there was a problem. And so my first sergeant, uh, First Sergeant Charles Williams, a ginormous 250 pound African American from, from Alabama, picked me up on his shoulders, just like you see in the movies, and we had to get to a secure location. So he threw me on his shoulders. He ran about 75 meters in a heavy firefight while we're getting lit up to carry me behind safety behind uh, some, some brick walls. And he laid me down as gentle as a baby and said, I got you, sir, I got you. At the same time, some of my, one of my platoon commanders, First Lieutenant Sam Moore, arrived on scene and directed the medevac. And uh, First Sergeant Williams carried me to the, to, the, in, the, to the helicopters that came in an extremely hot zone, getting lit up. And he said a prayer for me on the LZ and threw me in, inside the helicopter. So I had consciousness this whole time, even though I was, had massive blood loss. And I could quickly tell while I was in the short medevac flight back to the, to the nearest base that it was not good. Got back to the aid station and uh, they, they carried me in, threw me on the table, stripped my clothes off. I'm laying there naked. I'm grabbing two nurses by the arms, just squeezing their arms because I was in so much pain. And the surgeon at the, at the head of the table, his quote was, I don't like what I see here. And that's the last thing I remember. They shot me up with something that, that uh, knocked me out. And four hours later, they woke, he woke me up out of my surgery and he was basically standing on my table, said, you need to understand that your corpsman saved your life. So I spent nine weeks in Bethesda and uh, the Commandant of the Marine Corps actually came pretty frequently. and. He's the one that presented me with the Purple Heart in my, in my hospital, hospital room. You know, my thoughts were back to my Marines, honestly. You know, I was still very emotionally distraught that I could not be with them in Afghanistan during this time. Um, I had one of my Marines that was killed in Afghanistan while I was not there, Jacob Ross from Gillette, Wyoming. So that was very tough to know one of my Marines, even though he was in great care with his platoon commander, was died in, in, in the field of combat. Oh, so really, you know, I wanted, my, I, I wanted the pain to go away first, and I wanted to get out of the hospital and get back to my girls um, in North Carolina. So how did I get to this point here? Well, I think it's a good time to harken back to George Washington. So George Washington, he was the, his first term as president in 1790. He received a letter from his uh, nephew, George Steptoe 
Washington from what is now West Virginia. He was aged 19. He basically told George he wanted to come to Philadelphia to go to school. And so George, in this awesome letter in December 5th, 1790, he writes him this letter, and in that letter, he has a great quote. He's providing a mentorship to this young man. You know, what, you sh what, what, what should you do? And George Washington says, as the time is limited, that every hour misspent is lost forever, and that future years cannot compensate for the lost days at this point in your life. And so I try to hearken to that guidance of George Washington and take advantage of every minute. You know, I've gone through these experiences for a reason, and we only live one time. And while that may be challenging and difficulty, it's nothing but an opportunity. And so I try to take the negative and turn it to a positive. Uh, I graduated from the Citadel in 2001, and then, you, of course, we get a Citadel ring, one of the key identi identifying features of Citadel grads. And inside of my ring, there's two things that's engraved, my name and also a verse. Ecclesiastes 9.10, it says, whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your might. Then also, my ring says, suffer if need be. And so I've tried to embody those throughout my entire adult life. Suffering is going to happen, but do every, everything I do, no matter the circumstances, with all my heart, mind, and strength. After I was shot and, and medevaced out of country, the first trial I had was a mental trial, knowing that I could no longer leave my Marines in Afghanistan, very close to them. I was very fortunate. I had a, a phenomenal company, great young men, average age of 19 to 20 years old, who had the opportunity to lead. And being pulled away from them and knowing that I would not have the opportunity to continue the, deploy the deployment with them was very, very challenging on me. Then came the physical aspect of it, getting medevaced uh, out of Afghanistan to Germany where I had my initial surgeries, back to Bethesda to Walter Reed National Naval Med Medical Center uh, where I stayed there for nine weeks in literally excruciating pain. And so one of my surgeons up here by the name of Dr. Robert Howard, a great friend of mine now, he took a nerve from a cadaver wound it into a triple helix. He connected it to my existing nerve on the, on the top and bottom of my leg on the, on the, that was cut off. And he put a, a, a cellophane sheath around it and a wound vac. And he said, we'll see if this works. It doesn't work, you know, we have to amputate your leg. There's no other alternative course of action. I lived in a, a lot of pain for several months uh, until about October. I was laying in my chair at my house. And for the first time in six months, I could move my toes. I saw my toes move. And that was the first indication that my, that my leg was, that my nerve had somehow grown back together and started to reconnect. And so over the course of the next 23 months, I underwent about uh, 11 surgeries. And uh, they were some painful surgeries. My 10th surgery was especially painful. It was um, 14 months, about 10 months after I was shot, I was in immense pain. I originally had a plate on my tibia. That plate failed. My leg was twisted and turned inboard. I wanted to have my leg amputated. I just couldn't deal with the pain anymore. And so I traveled to Portsmouth, Virginia and met a, uh, a mad orthopedic surgeon, mad scientist by the name of Robert Gaines. And, and he rearranged my leg, twisted it, aligned everything up. He put a rod the length of my tibia and put in six screws. And I was walking the next day in the hospital and that singular surgery saved my leg. So I started riding a bicycle after my 10th surgery. When they sawed my leg in half, the surgeon told me, don't ever run again. I want you to get on a stationary bicycle. So I was undergoing you know, hundreds of uh, physical therapy sessions. I went back in May of 2011 and I started riding a stationary bicycle at physical therapy. The first one was about 30 seconds long and literally, literally I had tears in my eyes because it was so painful. I was very discouraged because you know, that's no physical fitness. Uh, but for the first time I had some mobility in my leg. Gradually progressed about a month and a half later I did my first outdoor ride of about 13 miles. And I was, it was in July because I remember the Tour de France was going on and I was enthralled when I was done with the ride because it was for the first time in 16 months I had done some form of physical fitness and flushed some toxins out of my body. So I started looking at cycling for the first time. I had no idea about it. Uh, Trek Bicycles from Waterloo, Wisconsin was having a deal at the time for Purple Heart recipients. And somehow I purchased a bike at a good discount from them at Trek Madone 6.2, made right here in the United States of America. And uh, I got that bicycle, but then 24 months after I was shot, I finally got back on the full duty and deployed back to Afghanistan. And so when I was back in Afghanistan in May of 2012, uh, I went to the little exchange there, bought a $100 Chinese bicycle. And I rode that bicycle 100, about 600 miles around the airfield I was stationed at. 
I got back to the United States and said I need to, do I need to commit and do this for real. So I started riding in January 2012. And I did my first 100-mile uh, ride with a good friend of mine named Matt Hawkins, who's the owner of Ridge Supply. And uh, that was an emotional experience to ride 100 miles. I was destroyed. Uh, and that grew to riding about 5,000 miles the first year. And then since 2012, uh, I've ridden about 56,000 miles, participated in ultra-endurance gravel races, you know, five times in the Dirty Kansas 200. Just finished the 338-mile the, uh, Dirty Kansas XL in 27 hours. I've done uh, this awesome race in Iowa called Trans Iowa. It's 340 miles in, in April. I, uh, other smaller races. Just this past weekend, I did a 157 mile race in the Monongahela National Forest where George Washington literally surveyed the land and traveled to and from. So that was a great historical experience and, and physical fitness experience. You know, it gives me a purpose in life. And it's also an opportunity for me to be an example to other individuals that are wounded and participate in these seemingly impossible races to show people that regardless of your mental or physical injuries, you can overcome them, live a life of purpose, and do amazing things. We only live one time, and so we should take advantage of every opportunity possible. It's quite an honor to be here at George Washington's Mount Vernon, especially as a member. There's many, it's many faceted angles to this. I live very close by. I ride my bicycle nearly every morning around his estates, around his five farms. I've done everything possible to study our founding father, to listen to countless podcasts, read countless books, attend lectures. And being here at Mount Vernon, to have the father of four daughters, to know that the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, begun in the 1850s by Ann Pamela Cunningham from South Carolina, where my wife is from, and seeing what a group of dedicated women can do to preserve this national treasure, it means a lot to me. And I, you know, our, our country unfortunately is going through a period where we don't necessarily study our founding fathers. We find reasons to bicker, complain, and to find fault with anybody and everyone and everything, as opposed to looking at somebody as great as George Washington and his, his selfless sacrifice. I mean, he lived in this mansion for 40 some years, was only here for about a half of it because of a dedicated life of service, both uh, during the Continental Congress, for Second Continental Congress, the American Revolution, where he was only back here one time, to his time as president during his retirement years. And so I think we need more of that, the selfless sacrifice to our country. You know, George Washington had an incredible vision about, there's a quote about how he talks about the impact of the untold millions in future generations. And our country has sacrificed 1.5 million Americans have died on the field of combat around this globe. Another 1.4 have been injured in combat. So that's 3 million Americans who in defense of the Constitution of the United States of America have not only provided us liberty since 1776 and freedom, but also countless millions around the globe. And the least we can do is be men of character and honor and selfless service and sacrifice to our country. So being here, every time I come to the mansion, I've been here, I'm embarrassed to say, probably 45 times in the last year. I think about that and think about what the men and women who lived here at the time, what they must have thought about and discussed when they made the conscious decision to break away from the British Empire and create our own free and independent self-governing country.